Hey everybody, Mr. J here. Today we're going to be going through a concept called capillary exchange, which is kind of a weird name for something relatively simple, okay? So it's going to answer the question, how does our blood actually feed the cells of our body? So let's set this up. You have approximately 30 trillion cells in your body. Every single one of those cells basically needs to make what's called ATP. Okay, so in order for those cells to stay alive, you must be producing this molecule ATP. Well, how do we make that? Well, in your cells, we have what's called mitochondria in most cell types. And that mitochondria will do a chemical reaction that will produce ATP energy for your cells. Okay, but in order to do that, these cells of your body need to receive proper nutrients. Okay, in order to make that ATP. So think of it as this is like the cake and we need some ingredients to make that cake. Well, what are the ingredients? In order to make ATP, you must have two main ingredients. Glucose which is a sugar that you eat, you ingest it, you combine it with six oxygen molecules, which you breathe in, and you will produce, so if those combine together in the mitochondria, you will produce six carbon dioxide, six water, and we have it, 32 to 36 ATP molecules. So this is the goal of that cell respiration equation, is to get glucose and oxygen into our cells of our bodies so that we can produce ATP. Now, the question is, again, how does our blood actually feed our cells these two main nutrients, as well as other nutrients like amino acids and uh, electrolytes and vitamins and those types of things? Well, I'm gonna go through the general process of how that happens, but first we need to step back a little bit. So we have three main areas here. So on this diagram, I have the cells of your body. So these are just any cell of your body. It could be in your liver, your muscle, your skin, all the same, okay? They all need a blood supply to stay alive. So these are your general cells, okay? You have the capillaries here. So these are the capillaries. Well, what the heck are capillaries, Mr. Jackson? Well, capillaries, are the smallest blood vessels that actually feed your tissue. So this is on the microscopic level where stuff is going to be seeping out of your capillaries to actually feed the cells of your body. And they're called capillaries. They're so tiny that only one red blood cell can pass through at a time. So super, super tiny, just a couple micrometers wide, okay? But then we have another space. And you may see this space as being nothing, but there is fluid surrounding the cells and the capillaries, and all of this space in between the cells is called the interstitial fluid. So this means in between tissues or in between cells. So we've got three major players here. We've got the bloodstream, so the capillaries, smallest unit of the blood vessels, interstitial fluid, the fluid surrounding the cells and the capillaries, and then the cells themselves. Now remember, we need to get nutrients, glucose and oxygen, into the cells. And also, we need to get rid of this nasty carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide in high amounts can actually kill off the cells. It can be slightly acidic, really screw up the cells. So we have a problem here. We need to feed the cells. We need to get those carbon dioxide molecules out. So let's start with how we feed the cells. In order to know what's happening here, we need to realize two things. The bloodstream, so when I say blood, it's composed of two different things. 45% of the blood is the cells of the blood. These are called formed elements of the, of the blood. And these are the living cells. So your red blood cells, your white blood cells. We're going to focus primarily on your red blood cells, which look like this. These are your red blood cells. I like to write RBCs, otherwise known as erythrocyte erythrocytes, which literally means red cell, okay? So these are your red blood cells. 45% of your blood that's flowing through your vessels are made of the cells. 55%, however, is your plasma. Now your plasma contains mostly water, some ions, and dissolved nutrients and wastes. So nutrients and waste. So really what we're doing here when we're feeding our cells is we are taking nutrients that are dissolved in the plasma and we need to get it to the cells. Okay, so let's step back a little bit. 
What do the red blood cells do in this case? Well, you may know that the red blood cells have a little protein called hemoglobin that likes to bind to oxygen. So they will bind a few oxygen molecules and they're going to deliver those oxygen molecules to the cells and I'll show you here in a second. Furthermore, there will be glucose, which looks like a little hexagon, so I can draw that over here for the glucose. Looks like a little hexagon, it's C6H1206, pretty big molecule, and it's going to be dissolved in the plasma. So around the red blood cells, dissolved in the plasma. And after you eat, glucose gets dumped into your bloodstream in higher amounts, your blood glucose raises, and now we need to get them into the cells. Okay, so those are the two things we're gonna focus on today. There's other nutrients, things like amino acids that you're going to feed to the cells. There's vitamins and other nutrients and those types of things, but we're only gonna focus on glucose and oxygen right now. So how does oxygen get into these cells? Well, we need to think about how it's going to be transported. And most of the times when things are moving without you doing really anything, it's going to be via diffusion. What's diffusion? Moving from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So if we think about it, we've got red blood cells that are just packed with oxygen, just ready to feed the cells. And the cells are actually using up the oxygen in this reaction. So it's using up a lot of oxygen. So automatically, we have this gradient established where we have high amounts of oxygen in the bloodstream, in the capillaries, and we have low amounts of oxygen in the cells themselves. Well, knowing diffusion, high likes to go to low. So this oxygen is going to diffuse across both the capillary cells membranes as well as the tissue cells membranes really easily because it's a nonpolar tiny molecule, and it's going to diffuse into the cells directly. So this is all the oxygen. Now the mediator here is the interstitial fluid. It'll just pass right through, go right into the cells. So that's easy. We got oxygen in via diffusion, high concentration in the, pl in the plasma and the red blood cells, low concentration in the tissues, easy diffusion, high to low. Now, glucose also has a gradient because in the bloodstream, I'm showing a lot of glucose that you just ate um, and it's going into your bloodstream. So you're gonna have a lot of glucose in your bloodstream as well. Well, here's a problem. Glucose is a pretty big molecule, okay? So there's two atoms in oxygen. In glucose, there is one, there are 24 atoms, so it's a pretty big molecule. And the issue is, is those can't easily diffuse across membranes. So it's going to get to the outside of this capillary bed and get blocked off. Why? You need to see a different video on the cell membrane, but glucose is a, what's called a polar molecule, so it has a slight charge to it. And the membrane's made of nonpolar cell membranes, so fats, lipids, and they don't like to mix, so it can't pass through easily. There's a problem. We need to get the glucose to the cells though, right? Here's how we do it. In the capillaries, there are small little windows in the capillaries, literally breaks between the cells, and these are just little holes where there's really nothing there. It's just little gaps. These little windows, are called fenestra, which literally means windows. So now there's these little fenestra that allow small nutrients and fluids to literally leak out into this fluid down their concentration gradients. So now glucose gets to the interstitial fluid. But you may say, well, Mr. Jackson, you said glucose can't pass through cell membranes. I did, unless they have a transport protein which these cells will all have. So they're gonna have these transport proteins. They're basically big garage doors that allow bigger cells or bigger molecules into the cells. And there will be specific transport proteins that will allow glucose into the cells. So now we have glucose and oxygen in the cell. They'll go into the mitochondria and they will make ATP. So we're happy, we did it. We fed the cells, right? Now, we also made waste products. So I'm gonna draw the waste products over on this side. What's the waste products? Water, which isn't a big deal. Most of this is made of water. ATP, which is gonna be used up in the cells themselves, and also CO2. Well, think about it. If the cells are producing a lot of CO2 inside of them from this equation, there's going to be a high amount of concentration in the cells. Think about it. In your bloodstream, you're likely gonna have a little less carbon dioxide, right? There's a gradient here, high to low concentration of carbon dioxide. So it's going to passively diffuse across the membranes 
and go into the bloodstream. And in fact, you don't know this yet, but it'll actually bind to the hemoglobin as well. Hemoglobin likes to scrub carbon dioxide and kind of uh, divvy it out in certain ways, which we'll talk about later on in the class. But it will attach to the red blood cells, diffuse in the plasma, and then get transported to the lungs to be breathed out. Now, why could it diffuse easily? It's also a small nonpolar molecule, so it passes through the cell membranes very, very easy. Okay, so this is called capillary exchange. It's how we actually feed the cells our, uh, our nutrients, our amino acids, and those types of things. But here's the deal. There's also, I have a lot of stuff I might have to erase a little bit, there's a lot of stuff going on here. <clears throat> in fact, these little windows, I'm going to erase this a little bit, in these windows, the fenestra, this doesn't only let out different nutrients, but it also lets out fluid, and that could be an issue. So, for example, when you have these fenestra and you're pushing nutrients out, fluid will also follow because water likes to follow uh, nutrients and solutes. So water, I'll draw that in blue just to make it easy, water will also leave the capillaries and kind of get stuck in this interstitial space. So now we're accumulating, accumulating some water. Okay, if you accumulate too much water in that interstitial space, in that interstitial fluid, this is called edema. So edema is when fluid leaks out of the capillaries and accumulates around the cells as well as around the capillaries. So the question is, how does your body naturally bring back the fluid into the capillaries? Because what we really want to do is when that fluid leaves, we want to bring it right back in. We want to bring it right back into our circulation so our blood volume stays constant. We do that via, I'm going to erase this, proteins called albumins. Albumins are these big globular proteins. So I'm gonna label this as albumin. And if you know anything about proteins, they are large and in charge. That means that they have a charge, usually a negative charge, okay? So in your bloodstream, there's all these big albumin proteins with strong negative charges. What does that do with the water? Well, if you learned from my previous lectures, water, has a slight charge within the molecule. So the oxygen is slightly negative, the hydrogens are slightly positive. That's what makes the polar molecule. And so when water leaks out, there are these massive proteins that are negatively charged that will pull, literally, the hydrogens of the water, which are slightly positively charged, and it's going to draw these towards itself because opposites attract. So now these albumins pull back this water via the charge difference. So the hydrogens in the water are slightly positive, the albumins are, are negative, and it's going to pull that water back into circulation, which is really helpful so that you don't lose a bunch of blood volume at the, at the tissue level. So how do, what do we call this? We call this providing osmotic pressure. So albumins provide osmotic pressure, which means literally water pressure. So there's this pressure of water to be pulled back into the capillaries and thus in, uh, regulate your blood volume. Now, not all of the fluid will be pulled back in. In fact, a lot of the fluid will get stuck in the interstitium and that's not always a good thing. So what we'll learn later on in class is that there will be other vessels called lymphatic vessels Okay, lymphatic vessels that will kind of be alongside of the capillaries and they are going to pull fluid back into themselves. So these are going to be your lymphatic vessels that will eventually go back to the heart. But we'll talk about the lymphatic system another time. So this was capillary exchange. We answered the question, how does our blood actually feed our cells? It's through diffusion, through fenestra, through transport proteins, a whole lot of great things that you need to know in order to understand these concepts properly. I hope this was helpful. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful, wonderful day.